Well, good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, coming to you from the studios at the Coming Home Network International in Central Ohio, but we're coming to you over EWTN Radio, and it's a wonderful privilege to be involved with EWTN. And as we begin this new year, Happy New Year's, everyone. Um, you know, again, we're, we're excited about the continuing apostolate of the Coming Home Network and the continuing witness of EWTN. And I do uh, pray that the witness of EWTN is an important part of your life. And if it is, I want to make sure you always remember to let EWTN know that. That's one of the things about radio is it can enter into our lives so freely that we tend to take it for granted. And you need to always remember that uh, whatever way you are hearing this program, whether it's through some kind of satellite radio or through a radio in your car or some kind of instrument, that you are receiving that at great expense. Uh, and it's a gift. It's a, a ministry. And it needs our support. So I strongly encourage you to consider doing that. We're very grateful that we can do this program over EWTN, and we have always greatly appreciated our partnership with them as we begin a new year. In fact, I think this is probably an anniversary of the Deep in Scripture program, because uh, I think we began in the beginning of the year. So again, thank you for uh, joining us, and let me also take this moment to remind you that there is a website associated with this program. If you go to chnetwork.org, that's the website for the Coming Home Network International, and there's a, a connection there to Deep in Scripture. So if you aren't doing this right now, you can actually go to that website and watch the program as we sit here in the studio, and you'll be able then to see our guest. And our guest today is Mike D'Andrea. Is that, how, is that how you say it, Mike? Yes. D'Andrea, D'Andrea? D'Andrea. Because I wasn't sure if it's Italian or French. It's Italian. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought so, but it's kind of like people mess my name up all the time. and They try and make it sound more European. But uh, as a car salesman, you just want people to, to know you and to buy from you. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Mike was a guest on the Journey Home program Monday night. I hope you enjoyed that. If you didn't see it, you can go and back to EWTN and watch when Mike was able to give a more full expression of his journey. He's a, a returning Catholic. Um, let me ask you this, Mike. Is there a sense in which every Catholic at some point has got to be a returning Catholic? I believe the story of the prodigal son, the son who stayed home with the father, and the son who left, I believe that we're like both of them at some point in our life. So I think so. I think everybody has. Some are more extreme than others, and I think mine was definitely extreme. And it took the uh, a, a grace of God. I hope that my children don't fall as far from the church as I did. And that's my hope and prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But every one of us, every one of us, I mean... It, even though this new year is a secular creation, looking at the year from January through December, um, you know, the church looks at itself through Advent through, um, you know, the liturgical year. But there's a value of us to take a step back and reevaluate our lives. Where are we at in our relationship with God? I know that you've advocated, uh, you know, regular retreats, which is a very much a Catholic thing, but you've yourself found those as a great part of, uh, taking a step forward in your own journey. Yes, I would say retreats and surrounding yourself with people that are like-minded and on the same journey that you're on is very helpful to get in a good prayer group that would sustain you regularly more often than a retreat. But a retreat has helped me, and I try to do it annually for a men's retreat. Um, and also with my wife once in a while, a marriage encounter early in our marriage, uh, after my reconversion was tremendously helpful to help us to communicate better as a, as a couple. Well, on Monday night, you were able to go through your whole journey as the Lord brought you back, uh, not just to the church, but back to faith, back to a relationship with Christ, right? right? I yes. Mean, that's really the key. Uh, but then 
appreciating the, the church which you had been born into, uh, one, 11, one of 11 siblings. Um, but as you mentioned Monday night, that was associated with a, an invitation by your, your, well, first of all, you had found yourself after a, a New Year's Eve party uh, a bit hungover and strung out and wondering, there's got to be more than this, and what am I going to do, and, and, and all the, the good questions that God puts into our life to wreck us up. But it was an invitation from your mother, right? Yes. yes. Really... I, I actually sought her out because she had something that I did not have at that particular time, and that was peace. My father had passed away three years prior. She was uh, left at home with four still to raise, and it did not strike her at all. She seemed to have the same peace mm -hmm. that she had prior, and she actually grew stronger in her faith, and I noticed that. And I had, on the outward, a lot of good going on in my life, but inward I felt so empty. And I, I sought her out because of her example. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and talk is cheap. I believe that her example is what brought me to go to her and say, here's where I'm at. What do I need to do from here? Because I want what you have. Hmm. In the Protestant world, which is where I come from, um, in general, there's no mm, consistent theology of suffering, of offer it up which is so Catholic, you know. Do you, yeah. ever, do you ever hear your mother say that, you know, offer it up? I mean, you, you probably did. Uh, I didn't. Yes, I did. But I, I've i come to believe that one of the secrets of our Catholic disciplined faith over a long period of time is that it prepares us as we get older to accept the normal stresses and struggles and sacrifices and suffering and disappointments uh, that come with life, but we're better prepared to face those as we get older because all along the church has been training us to accept suffering. Right. That's what fasting's all about. That's what denying ourselves and these little things. So as we get older, we can face the big things. We don't end up a big whiner Correct. complaining about everything. Do you think that was part of the key in your mother's life? That she, all those years and living out her faith, that it actually prepared her. So when she went through this, the loss of her husband, all the challenges, that spiritually she had been strengthened for that as she got older. I believe God's love and mercy prepares us for any test as long as we're willing to have a relationship with him. In her case, she tells this story to us about how she had a dream about six months before my father became sick with cancer. Hmm. And in that dream, the Lord was handing her a cross. And she said, no, no, no. And she saw that our Lord felt sad that she wasn't willing to accept that. And she said, yes, I will take that. Hmm. And she took it. And it wasn't long after that that she found out that my father was ill. And it was about a year and a half uh, of suffering for him. Mother Teresa says that suffering is the greatest gift God can give us. And I sense that in, in his life, since it's become a gift to our family, his suffering. I've seen so much good happen from it. She became uh, what I believe to be a saintly person through that suffering and has led so many people closer to a relationship with God. So it's hard to say, yep. and, and we'll only know in, in once we get to be with our Lord what, what actually, whether that was from him, but I believe that it can be a good thing. Well, the in this program, what we do is, since we can't always focus on Scripture on Monday night, uh, what we've tended to do in this program is uh, invite the guests to spin, stick around a little bit and talk about some Scriptures that made a difference in the journey 
um, and to, to get deep in those scriptures to see how they help us grow in our relationship with our Lord Jesus and his church. Um, and the scripture you've chosen is 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 7. Before we read it and look into it just more in general, why this particular verse, Mike? Because I felt like it was this verse is opposite of who I was. Hmm. I felt I f- was filled with pride prior to my reconversion. Uh, you had mentioned I'd played college football, tried out for the Minnesota Vikings, um, had very little spiritual uh, life at that time. Hmm. And I just, because of that, I felt like I overcompensated the uh, other part of me, which is the physical and spent a lot of time working out and uh, just just fed my ego. And the world kind of does that for athletes sometimes to a fault. And so this really struck me after my reconversion, I found a little booklet. It was called Love People by a priest who started a school who at the time of the writing of the book was in his late 70s. And it was just really touched me. And it's a book that I keep near me and read from time to time as I feel the need to love people more and more. I think that's the ultimate goal in life. And I find the more that I love, the happier I am. Yeah, because we're, if we're looking at 1 Corinthians um, 13, 4, 7 as, a, uh, as our verse today, I'm just going to draw back here, see if I can find it really quickly, that Paul had said that, where it's in Galatians, I'm trying to find it here, but basically he says very clearly that all of the law and the prophets are, he says in Galatians 5, 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so as a preview to 1 Corinthians 13, I mean, he's saying this is it. Yes. This is it, all the law, all all of that, the sanctions that had so controlled people's lives. What he's basically saying, the the reasons for those in the first place was love. Yes. And we know God is love. And so that that is a big part of who we are as a church, is, is a church of love. I think you look at the world, and if the world would take serious this teaching how can the world be changed and it could be just a totally different world because a world with just love jesus said love your enemies love those who hate you persecute you and do all types of evil to you that is so opposite of the human experience right now yeah and if we would embrace that how much better this world can be before we read the verse again, one more thing. Those of you, I'm sorry I'm dragging us off here, but you had mentioned that this was so opposite of what you were, and that's why it touched me. Touched you as a football player with an ego. Well, let me ask you this. Is it, what's the chicken and an egg thing here? I mean, is it the ego that makes a good football player, or is it being a football player and trying to be a better football player than being a better football player? out of which comes the ego? Or, or is it, does it really take that ego? Is it a necessary part of, of doing the role? I don't know if it's necessary. I think that it is very easy to acquire a big ego uh, when you're playing a sport, especially at a high level, hmm. because you spend so much time in it and it becomes such a big part of your life that sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees because you're in the forest all the time. So you, I really didn't have a good perspective on life at that time. It was just so f- single focused that I think yeah. that helped feed into that. I'm wondering if that's why someone like Tim Tebow, and I hate to, I'm hesitant to, to lift him up only because I don't know him personally, but. Yet, I'm just very uh, impressed by the sincerity of, of his convictions. But is that why he also gets such antagonistic press? Because to rise through the ranks from, you know, from, uh, you know, 
Warner football, isn't that what it was called? You yes. Know, you know, yeah. at the bottomest ranks of the football world, the feeder system through junior high and high school, then all the colleges, and then to be able to get into the training camps, which is where you ended up. And then to end up, there, aren't, there are only so many quarterbacks that are getting paid as professional football players. Right. To make it to that level. The odds are very stacked against you. So to not end up with an ego is tough. Because you also got to be a leader that you're leading a bunch of tough dudes out there. Yes. So you need a strong character, a strong leader. But to have someone that says, no, 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 Jesus is number one. Family's number two. Football's just number three. Yes. To be at that level takes the conviction of what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. And it appears that his parents encouraged him from the time he was young to do missionary work. And I think that helped keep him as grounded as he is. And so he he has a compassion for the human person, and he gets the big picture, which 99% of the athletes don't have that perspective. And, And thankfully, he had that type of parent. And I think that he embraces everybody, and he's a team player, and the players buy into the way he leads. He leads by example. I think that the negative media is a gift to him from God because if everybody was on his side and lifting him up and saying, what a wonderful man, I think that would be more dangerous for him. And that's why we need to keep the uh, uh, people like him in prayer yes, because there they are uh, under so much uh, public attention yes as well as being attacked for their sincerity and but he's a model for every one of us because there you are mike you've got to live out your job as a leader in your industry and all of us are right so paul is saying okay but all of this all the things that in your life that seem to be uh giving you uh direction on how to live it's all summarized in one word and that is, as he says, you love your neighbor as yourself. And then someone might say, hey, what, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, let me tell you. And that's what chapter 13 of Corinthians is all about. Yes. All right. Let me read this for audience. And then, Mike, why don't you just jump into it? Because it's such a great, I mean, how many of us have not heard this in a wedding ceremony? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So given those qualifications, do you love, Mike? (laughs) I try every day. (laughs) Every day we get up and we fail in certain areas. And I feel a lot like... Uh, I'm talking to God all day long to work with me on certain behaviors that I experienced through the day. When I played football, at each practice in your individual drill, they would videotape everything that you did throughout that practice. And then the next day at practice, you would spend time with your individual coach and watch film and correct the mistakes that you made and constantly try to get better as an athlete at your singular position. I think the spiritual life can be the same way, that we have to have a video camera in our mind going throughout the day, and at the end of the day, try to view that camera. What did I do good today? What did I do wrong? What would our Lord be pleased with and not pleased with? And ask for the forgiveness but constantly videotaping ourselves to try to be more of what he wants us to be, and that is of love. In fact, there's a, a verse in this very chapter, not far after this, when Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And it makes you wonder... Um, in our journey of growing intimate with our Lord Jesus, part of that is 
getting a clear vision of ourselves to really see ourselves yes in our faults yes and a lot of us just see through a glass dimly yes. and maybe it's blacked out we don't see ourselves at all the way we are and it's, that is a grace in itself to be able to see it so that we can change it is and you know the fear that we have should be of the person in the mirror that's our enemy and we have to guard against our enemy and to do that you have to put on the face of christ in that mirror i remember my grandmother used to always say that you may be the only jesus that somebody gets to see today and that always struck me and i know at the end of the day i wasn't that jesus that she had asked me to be at times and so you try to correct that the next time you see that person to try to be that what she has asked you to do I want to press you on that because let's clarify that. When we look in the mirror, that's our enemy. Because when we talk about we're looking at ourselves, are, are we our enemy? There's that phrase, we are our worst enemy at times. Um, but Paul and our Lord Jesus do call us to love one another as we love ourselves. So there's got to be a balance there. So talk about in your own, because you've come through this yourself yes. from being one that you felt was a bit too egotistical, yet coming still, it doesn't mean you don't love yourself now. Right. It can't mean that. It doesn't. I think it, it means that we are to put on Christ. And I think th you can do that through the sacramental life, by going to confession as often as you need, by taking your faith seriously and trying to be a better person each day, reading scripture, praying your rosary, um, reaching out to others is very critical in your spiritual journey. Surrounding yourself with people who can encourage you to be better. I personally have a wonderful wife who, when she sees me not being that man that I feel I'm called to be, she'll be quick to point it out in a loving way. And as a man, we need that at times from our spouse. But it's only going to happen if we take our faith serious because she'll follow along with us. She'll, we'll, we'll be encouraging to each other. So I encourage men, especially those who are married, to lead your wife to her faith. You know, a lot of the Italians in the old days would send the wife to church on Sunday. <laughs> and that's changed. Yeah. And I embrace that change. Well, there was... Um in a a book that contained the writings of of eastern christian spiritual writers um a one of the writers talked about the sin of self-esteem i know i've talked about this on the program over the years the sin of self-esteem and how do you break from that and <clears throat> i remember mentioning this once to actually to a nun, and she was upset because she admitted that she was always trying to help people grow in their self-esteem. And I said, the, the spiritual writer says it's a sin. And and the spiritual writer said the cure of the sin of self-esteem, and he was writing to monks, yes. is to get out of your cell and go help somebody. You get your attention off yourself and give of yourself. So it isn't, when you look at the mirror, if all you see is you, and you're, you're, you're focused on self-esteem, in other words, how you are in your own eyes, then you're going to fail. Yes. That's the, it's how you are in the eyes of God. Yes. And so you want to see more and more of the Lord Jesus in your own eyes, in your actions. And I think that's why the first statement that's here in this, which we're going to take a break in a second, so we'll come back to this when he begins with love is patient. It, of all the things you could say there, the first one he begins at is the necessity of patience, even in growing in love, because yes. we're going to keep failing. Yes. And so let's talk about that when we get back. You're listening to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, joined today by Mike D'Andrea, and you're hearing us on EWTN, your global Catholic radio network. 
This Deep in Scripture radio program is produced by the Coming Home Network International, a nonprofit Catholic lay apostolate dedicated to helping Protestant clergy and laity come home to the Catholic Church. You can listen to any of our past radio programs by logging onto our website, which also offers a wealth of information on our Catholic faith, including conversion stories, an online forum, and available resources to help you to find the truth of our faith. Visit us today at www.deepinscripture.com. Get an insider's look at the latest information from EWTN. Sign up for WINGS, EWTN's weekly email newsletter. Get the latest information about live events, special features, and guests. Connect with EWTN on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Just go to EWTN.com and click on the WINGS link to sign up. Don't miss a minute of all that's happening at EWTN. Get your WINGS today. CH Resources is excited to offer you Marcus Grodi's latest book, Thoughts for the Journey Home. If you're not Catholic but are looking seriously at the Catholic Church, or if you've recently entered the Church, this book will provide you with wisdom and encouragement for the journey. And if you're a lifelong Catholic, it makes a great gift for family and friends you're hoping will come home. To order a copy, visit our website at chnetwork.org or call us at 1-800-664-5110. Don't forget to watch the Journey Home program with Marcus Grodi on EWTN. Each week, Marcus meets new guests who have journeyed to the Catholic faith from many backgrounds. Be challenged and encouraged as they witness to how their love for the truth of Jesus Christ has brought them into full communion with the Catholic Church. That's the Journey Home program on EWTN, live on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Hello, welcome back to Deep in Scripture, and uh, our guest today is Mike Nandrea, and um, we are right in the middle of our program, although I do want to remind you in this beginning of the year to go to our website, chnetwork.org, because I am really excited to to announce that I do have a new novel out. Um, I wrote the first one, How Firm a Foundation, a number of years ago, and the new one, Pillar and Bulwark picks up where that one left off and it really is the the story about uh, men and women in their journey struggling with faith uh, and what is true and in a fictional format I'm able to give you the more intimate workings out of their lives and how a journey of faith affects their relationship so I encourage you if you're interested go to our website chnetwork.org well Mike thanks um for joining us today. Let's pick up again. We've looked at 1 Corinthians 13. We're just looking at it. Um, this first first verse of the bunch, love is patient and kind, love is not jealous or boastful. How do you want to jump into this text? Well, I think in my particular life, patience has been acquired over time. I think through fasting and prayer has been a big help to acquire patience, but also on the natural level, having children, being from a large family. I was in the middle of 11, so you learn to get along (laughs) and you acquire patience because if you don't have it, it's a very difficult life. (laughs) But as I went into those college years, I became more self-absorbed, self-seeking. And then when I uh, married my... uh, high school sweetheart and at the end of college we started having children within five years we had two children and at that time I did not have the same patience that I had as a young man and so I kind of had to relearn it and it was only through prayer and some fasting to get out of myself and learn to be more kind Mm -hmm. and loving and a good encouragement from my wife, who was a good example for me. The the beauty of this passage, I've always felt, is that the way Paul expresses these phrases is they're both analytical and exhortative at the same time. Love is patient. So in other words, you look at that, and you say, okay, 
from an analytical standpoint, we look at our lives and my patient to determine, okay, how's my love? But on the other hand, then exhortative, I'm called to love, so I need to be patient. Yes. There's a both and there. Yes. And the beauty of the, the irony is the patience mean you don't give up once you've analyzed yourself and said, well, I'm not a very good lover because I'm so impatient or that I'm called to love and so I need to change to be patient. Well, and this, how am I going to do this? Well, in the process to do it, you're to be patient. Yes. To let God work on you, to change you, move yeah. you along. And my guess is that's what you're saying. You you was awakened for you, especially when you you had that reconversion experience when you were visiting the shrine. Yes. Uh, the uh, what about the issue of kindness? That he says, or love is patient, love is kind. I'm trying to imagine you as a as a linebacker backer out there being kind to one of those guys coming at you. <laughs> I think that is a difficult thing to envision. <laughs> However, I never did get involved in the trash talking that sometimes <laughs> takes place. I was too focused on overcompensating my slowness and thinking of the next play to worry about that, which was a gift. Um, but I think that in, in sports, like everything else, you acquire it through... Uh, your family values. We did have a good example from our parents uh, that was not expected to be unkind to anyone. However, when you get out on your own, you know, that sometimes that does seep in, the, the lack of kindness. And I think, you know, through Scripture, it calls you to a deeper thought of this. I do remember an experience when my coach got mad at me in college football. And it was not long after my Christian awakening. Because I remember when I played tight end, my job on each play was to block somebody. And basically my job was to knock them on their but, right, their yeah, backside, yeah. You know, more appropriate, because you know, nicer way to say it. That was my job. But one time I did that, and then I helped him up. And my coach got on me for doing that. Yes. But I remember the part of my thinking was, how do I live these things out? in life that seemed like i did my job i knocked him down well now i'm going to help him up coach said you don't do that <laughs> my guess is that would have been the same advice you got when you played for ohio state i think different coaches had a different thought process on that i know that when i was at ohio state it was not discouraged to help somebody up as you know you're you're doing the best you can and that was not something that was mandatory that you do not do. However, I know players who have played for coaches like yourself, especially in a professional level, that that was not not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. yeah which yeah. is sad. What about in the working world? What does kindness mean? It means creating a working environment. I'm self-employed and have been for 25 years. And the reason I became self-employed was I did not like the stress level at the bigger dealerships that mm -hmm. I had worked at. And I wanted to create more of a authentic, peaceful working environment. Is it perfect? No, it's not a utopia by any stretch. However, when you surround yourself with like-minded people and people that care about one another, and it's all about team building, Good businesses are about having a team concept. And that's what I learned so much that has helped me in my adult life with sports is you're on a team, you're all working for a common goal, and you help each other and you encourage one another. And that's what we've tried to create at our at our store. Yeah, if you look at some of these uh, uh, statements by Paul and try to imagine them how you use them to establish a, a working environment that, I mean, you're in a business, you're there to make money and to support the families that work for you and provide a good life for everyone working for you. Of course you are. And you have customers. But like a few things, let me throw these out at you. How do you work out as a leader in an organization? Love does not insist on its own way. There's an, an example. Of one. Yes. That you can't always win. 
you know, it's a give and take. Same as in a marriage, you have to be willing to work with others. And you just learn and acquire that over time, that if you do that, if you give and take, your life is so much happier because you're not always having to get your way and you will not always get your way. And if you do, you will become a monster and uh, you won't be a team builder. What about uh, love is not irritable or resentful? The old man in me was irritable (laughs) and that's the lack of peace that I had. And that's why I went to our Lord to acquire that was asked for his help to when I got on my knees January 1st in 1987 I said a prayer that our Lord please help me change me I do not like who I am please help me and that simple prayer was answered in time there's a lot of scriptures in the Proverbs Psalms that uh, that warn about holding grudges, bitterness, how it will eat away. And uh, Paul in Philippians says, Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own. In other words, he says, I'm not perfect yet. Yes. Uh, I'm just not there, but he says. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straightening forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, the prize of the upward call. I mean, when, in any of these issues, especially not being irritable or resentful. I mean, that phrase, not a resentful. Now we're dealing with that inner man in which we're holding on what we think is just. Yes. You know, I've been hurt. Yes. And so I got a right to hold on to this or to, to get my just reward. And, and Paul's saying, you, know, you, you forget. Yes. And move on. Yes. I mean... I'm sure that that's a part of your own experience, my friend. Yes. (laughs) Father Shaman, in his book, Love People, he gives us seven steps, seven different ways in which we could fight against anger. One is to deny yourself. You know, do not be self-seeking or self-indulgent. Love is not self-seeking. And so that's one thought process. Number two, be calm, cool, and collective. Sometimes you need to count to 10. Sometimes you need to count to 100. I always find when dealing with my children, if I would just wait, when I first hear something, Mm. don't respond immediately. Digest it. Think about it. Because sometimes you respond in the wrong manner too quickly, and you say something you wish you would have never said. Number three, he talks about sometimes just turn tail and run because there's certain battles you're never gonna win. And so it's better to say nothing. Jose Maria Escriva said once, remain silent and you'll never regret it. Speak and you often will. Yeah, there's a lot of proverbs about that. There's that old, that old statement about the general picks his battles, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, number four is keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Five is make allowances for other people. Always think the best, that they, you know, their interest is the best. And number seven is pray. You know, give it to God. Pray for your anger to subside. Pray that you are a peaceful person. Try to live that love and try to love everyone regardless of how they behave towards you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Look, we're going to take another break. What I'd like to come back to as we look at some of these more the other statements that Paul makes about love, I'd like us to come back to why the church is necessary for us to be able to love truthfully. All right. Let's yes. come back to that after okay. the break. You're listening to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Rodi. Joined today by Mike D'Andrea, and you're hearing us on EWTN, your global Catholic radio network. 
EWTN.com is online with program information, the latest news, Pope Benedict XVI, plus tools for living the faith like prayers, Catholic Q&A, and other resources. Log on today to EWTN.com. The Coming Home Network International is a nonprofit Catholic lay apostolate dedicated to helping Protestant clergy and laity come home to the Catholic Church. It was founded by Marcus Grodi, the host of this program, as well as the Journey Home television program on EWTN. If you are interested in learning more about our Catholic faith, or if you know someone who is interested in becoming Catholic, please visit our website at www.chnetwork.org or contact us at 1-800-664-5110. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. Your host, Marcus Grodi, Mike and DeAndrea, and uh, we were just talking there during the break uh, about some of these issues. Because I do think this is important. You came back uh, to an appreciation of the church yourself, Mike, from uh, living in, as a committed football player, you right. know, living it out. You wanted to do what was, what was best. And then uh, when the Lord closed that door, which you had said last Monday night, was you were thankful for. Yeah. Uh, you, some, you knew it wasn't going to be professional football, so you, you went into business and and all of that. But in your discovery of the importance of loving, I want you to talk about why it is important as a Catholic that God has given us a church as opposed to every individual person loving. Right. right. And, the, and the danger of that I, our culture has so many mixed examples of love. And I think as a Christian to truly love, in the Catholic faith we have the sacraments that will help us to love properly and to look for love in the right places. Confession is a great gift. The Eucharist is the greatest gift that man can have. And if one receives the Eucharist worthily, St. Paul says that when you do good works, you can no brag or boast because it's no longer you but Christ in you. So I think to mold in a proper love the church teachings even on contraception, that, that's a great way of learning love. You have new respect for your spouse as not an object of your pleasure, but a procreative act of love. And to my wife and I, when I became serious about my faith, that was a real eye-opener for us. And it made me personally realize why my parents took their faith so seriously. If you think about, in your, I love you tying this to the sacraments, how the sacraments do, within the teaching of the church, help us understand what love is. If we go in the Old Testament, there's a great story about a man by the name of Naaman, I think I got it right, who was a leper. He'd gotten leprosy, yeah. and he went and wanted to be healed. And the advice was, go down and wash in the Jordan River. And I think his answer was, you know, I got better rivers I can go. I don't want to go down there. But what he needed to do was the humility, the humility of accepting the answer. Yes. And in the sacraments, demand our humility. A lot of people say, I don't want to go to a priest. Right. I can just talk to Jesus. And God says, no. You know, for you, to, the love means that humility. Yes. To, to accept that. Uh, the sacrament of marriage and the way the church teaches what marriage is about demands what this love chapter is about and, and humility. Yes. To know love, the church demonstrates it in a variety of ways. The Eucharist. Yeah. Every time we receive our Lord in the Eucharist, we're, you know, we're, we're challenged intellectually, what we see and taste and feel. And the Lord says, you've got to trust me on this one. Yes. I'm, I'm here. That's, that's what really love is all about. What about this last statement? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things endureth all, all things all things is a lot yes 
With God, all things are possible. And without God, nothing is possible. I like to quote often Padre Pio because I'm Italian and (laughs) I studied him uh, for many years once I had a reconversion. And he would say, pray, hope, and don't worry. And that has always stuck with me. And it's been a great encouragement to me. And I mention it to my friends when they share with me things that are going on in their life. What can I do? It's always the answer. And the answer never changes because it's always true. We need to pray. We need to hope and not to worry. Because if you trust in God, there's no reason to worry. Because whatever happens, if you allow whatever happened to be, you pray for God's will. That's one thing my mother taught me. Whatever you pray, just pray for his will. And that's what the Our Father does. It it prays for his will. And when we let that happen, our lives are at peace. Because even if it's something that we do not like or want, if we know that it's God's will and accept that will, we're so much happier. I remember seeing the movie, Life is Beautiful. Did you see that movie, I'm, Marcus? I can't remember if I did, I'm sorry. It was a wonderful movie, and the actor who did the male actor in that movie, Bernini, won the best male actor of the year award was for it, that movie. Was, was that the one in the, the Prisoner of War camp? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he took his son, and it was his birthday present. It was in Auschwitz. but. He won the best male actor of the year for this award. This movie was like a $4 million budget, was expected to do almost nothing. And when he got up and received the award, he said, I have to thank my mom and my dad for giving me the greatest gift they can give me. And without that gift, I could not have won this award and I would not be who I am. And that gift is the gift of poverty. (laughs) <laughs> so that would be something that, you know, we as humans would not expect somebody to say, especially in Hollywood. Yeah, especially in Hollywood. Well, again, that gets back to uh, the necessity of the church to help us understand the virtues and vices. Paul says in verse 6 here that uh, love does not rejoice at wrong but rejoices in the right. Well, if we're left to ourselves to decide what's right or wrong, then we have people rejoicing when we see somebody hurt because it's good for me. Right? Right. You know, so you you have a completely improper, imbalanced, skewed understanding of right and wrong. Right. And we can get there. Yes. Um, in fact, if I remember that movie right, is, I think that's the one where, the, the, is that the one where the father's trying to help the son escape, I- escape, but but have no clue of what's going on around him in the concentration camp. He wants to hide him from that reality so that he can deal with helping his son. And he presents it as a birthday present to him that we're going to this camp and this is your birthday present. Yeah. That, uh, because he, he's at the core of what is right and wrong is there. I actually know someone who is pro-abortion because they believe it's the most loving thing to do. Well, I mean, you can define anything right or wrong if, yeah. if you're just going on what you're feeling is good or bad for a person. That was called situation ethics a while back. The situation defines what's right or wrong. It can change depending on the situation. No. No. That's why Christ gave us a church. And sometimes it requires the humility, not demanding our own way, as it says in here. Yes. But this issue of bearing, believing, hoping, enduring, which you said in your quote from Padre Pio, that, that really defines us maybe as we're closing how does a person start over and start living love i think it's a daily commitment you know in the business world we're taught to have a daily weekly monthly annual goal and i think in the spiritual life if you take the same 
thought you can accomplish a great deal with God's grace. One of the things that you really need to do is pray. And as a Catholic, you have the rosary, which many has said is the great, great spiritual uh, power to overcome a lot of sin in our life. And I can personally attest to that. The other, the greatest thing that we could do is attend Mass as often as possible. If you're capable of going daily, you need to do it because it will change you quicker than anything because the Eucharist is Christ and you'll be receiving him. Be in relation with people who are trying to better themselves. Seek them out as you would seek out a good spouse. Seek out good friends and keep those friendships. Love them and realize that they are just like yourself, imperfect creatures who are trying and striving to draw closer to God. And so I'd encourage that. And those are good words, Mike. I, you know, when I, whenever I do the program, especially when we're talking about challenging things like this, I realize I'm, I'm far myself from living out these things. And that's why the passages that you've chosen, Mike, really could stand as a morning wake up call. Yes. Every day for all of us to number one be an analytical instrument and number two be the exhortation for the day yes am i this this is what i'm to be lord help me yes right that's the grace of it am i patient and and then and then letting tomorrow go i mean yesterday go especially if you've been hurt and that hurt is lodged in the heart. Maybe that's for the 6,590th time that that same person has hurt you. And there may be justifiable reason to let that fester. How much cancer has been caused in human life because of that? In the word, I'm sorry, or please forgive me. What a critical thing that can, how that can change a life. That's right. And as you mentioned cancer, we shouldn't let a day go by when we don't say, I'm sorry, yes. or I forgive you. Yes. And, uh, or I love you. I love you. That's a, that's a good thought. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you, Marcus. If anyone wanted to get in touch with you, we've got a website or something. It's miraclemotormart.com. All right. And that's in Columbus. So thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I'll keep your prayers up for your work and your family. Thank you. And all of you joining us, I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Look at that 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 passage. Write it on your wall or right in front of you. Look at it and pray every morning so all of us can love the Lord and each other. God bless you. See you soon.